The title is Work from Two Bodies, and I'm glad you asked that question because on one level, uh, it's, it's just uh, a very ex ex exploratory title. That there's two bodies of work in it, and so, um, so that's that. But actually, um, the title is a reference to um, a book that was published in the mid-1960s by the photographer Lee Friedlander and the um, artist Jim Dine, who collaborated on a book, Jim Dine's Prints and Friedlander's Photographs, uh, it was called Work from the Same House, and it was a very important book, um, and it was Lee Friedlander's first book, actually. So uh, I, I am sort of paying homage to that. Uh, I don't know how many people would recognize it, but um, there is a reason for this title. First of all, um, the cliché Vare pictures, um, which were which was work that I did uh, starting in January 1982, and then it morphed into what I call the shadow pictures. So I did it from, um, from early 1982 into 1985. And um, it was, it came from uh, really a frustration about um, where I was at the time. Um, I, I was I was do I was out of grad school for a couple of years, and I was I was doing work that was mostly manipulated. Um, I would work on the the photographs with oil paints and pencils and things like that. And when I got finished, um, I I would have one picture, and it was a unique object. And I felt that since I was a photographer, I wanted to be able to have objects that were uh, reproduced, okay? Um, as Walter Benjamin said, you know, it's, it's the age of mechanical reproduction and so we can uh, have more than one identical copy or similar copy. So I was trying to think of a way where I could do the handwork, combine the handwork with the photographic image and um, be able to make multiple copies. And the answer turned out to be um, cliché vert, which is actually a 19th century process. I'm not sure who invented it, but um, I think Camille Corot was the first to use it. And he basically painted on a piece of glass and then took an etching tool and scratched into the glass and thus eliminating parts of the paint. And then he took that piece of glass as if it was a negative and he contacted printed it onto a piece of photographic paper, and where it was scratched through, it would come through black. And then where it was still painted over, it would come through right, white. And since he was you know, very good at what he did, uh, there, was, uh, there were gradations of tones. So what I did was I took, um, actually scalpel blades worked best, and I scratched into the negative, shapes and figures and things like that. Um, and in scratching away the emulsion of the negative, it was like scratching away the paint. So anything that was scratched away in terms of emulsion, when I printed it, would come out black. And then if I scratched on the other side of the negative, it would create kind of a diffraction pattern. And so whatever I scratched on the other side of the negative would come out white. So in other words, I could just sort of draw with black and white on a negative and then put it in the enlarger and make a print and make another print, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I started doing. Um, one of the things that was um, a challenge was that I was working with 35 millimeter negatives. And um, that means that the negative is an inch long, I'm sorry, an inch high and an inch and a half long. So um, trying to make intricate little drawings on a space of that size um, was something that I really had to get used to. And I, and I worked very, very closely. I didn't use any magnifying equipment. And um, I don't know, maybe I have, uh, uh, you know, special eyes for this, but I, I was able to do it. And some of the early work, which is not in this book, um, was just crazy. I mean, it was, it was so intricate. And um, there were so many things going on and so many figure ground kind of ideas. And as I worked, the work got simpler, actually. I mean, paradoxically. And um, 
it became more discrete shapes. And of course, when you when you scratch away the the emulsion, you get a black area. So if I wanted to scratch a person or draw a person or something like that, they would end up being a, a silhouette. They would end up being a black shape. Um, I saw them as silhouettes. I also saw them as um, semiotics in a way, as signs, as if you're passing a sign that says deer crossing or pedestrian crossing where you have that, that black shape. Um, and so I started working with that. And, and most of the, the images here, like for example, the cover image um, is a, a spotted dog. And this is a real spot and this is a spot that I added just by grinding out the negative. And th this was, um, you know, for me, it was a play on three dimensions into two dimensions, which is something that is really integral to the nature of photography. And so uh, I would do that sort of thing, or I would, um, you know, add characters in, uh, uh, I, I went to graduate school in Chicago, and I was very influenced by the Chicago imagists, um, people like Jim Nutt, Roger Brown, Gladys Nielsen. And, and I love their work because they, they seem to combine surrealism and cartoons, even though uh, I was a photographer and they're all painters. So this kind of work comes from that. Uh, actually, interesting thing about this picture, this was, um, I don't know, I think it was a Greek restaurant across the street from where I lived in Cambridge. And um, that's me, the, the feeder me, and then there's a, a minotaur scratched in. and. Um, when John Sarkowski, who was the, um, the curator of photography at MoMA uh, from 1962 and into the 90s, I think, um, when he saw this, he said, oh, that, that's, a that's a metaphor for the decline of Western civilization because I was wearing these Nikes. I mean, I, mean, I had no you know, pretensions on doing that, but it, it was interesting to hear what somebody else would say. So doing the... Um, the uh, scratch pictures, okay, um, you know, you can, conceptually, you can see how I moved from scratch to shadow, because the silhouette was really um, a, a rough kind of version of a shadow. Uh, and also, I was interested, as you can see here, in, in the doppelganger, you know, in something that was going on in sort of a parallel world to what the photograph showed. I mean, it, it wasn't, you know, nobody would actually think that this really was going on, but, um, but so, so there was some humor in that. And so when I switched to shadows, the technique changed. And what I did was um, I would photograph and find, I would photograph shadows. I'd walk down the street and photograph shadows and find the shadow that I wanted to fit into um, a photograph. And I'd go through this elaborate darkroom process and I'd make a high contrast negative of just the shadow. And then so I would put the negative for the image into the enlarger and, and expose it. Then I'd take that negative out, I'd put the negative for the shadow into the enlarger and expose that, and then I'd develop it. And it took a lot of practice because the image of the shadow, you know, you had to make, um, basically you had to make grid marks so it wouldn't end up here or end up down here. You had to put it exactly where you needed to put it and you couldn't shine the light on the paper because then you'd keep exposing it. Also, you wanted to make sure that it had the right kind of translucency, the shadow, so it looked like a shadow. And also you had to put it a little bit out of focus so it had um, it didn't, the edges weren't too sharp. So that was um, this work, basically. And here I'm just pairing, um, you know, images uh, in, in whatever way I thought they looked best from a uh, conceptual point of view or a design point of view. This picture here was the first picture that um, the Museum of Modern Art acquired from me. And this, is, this was taken in a Revere Beach in 1984. I love Revere Beach. I'd never go swimming there, but I think that um, the population there and things that go on there with all the bikers and all that, it's, it's completely surreal. And um, so I, I used to go there all the time. Um, things shifted a little bit. These were some later things, and actually um, 
I, I sort of went back to uh, silhouettes as opposed to shadows. And uh, you know, I, I think that anybody who's familiar with the Vietnam War knows these two images. This is Eddie Adams' um, execution of a suspected Viet Cong terrorist. Uh, this is um, Nick Oot's uh, napalmed girl running, and they're, they're iconic images. And so what I did was I put them into pictures that I took to try and make a, sort of a, a resonance between the um, photographic imagery and what I either scratched in or put in. Um, and this, of course, you know, it says, Happy Birthday, America, Car Wash. Um, and here, it's like these ghosts are, 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 are running through a, um, a working class neighborhood and there's an American flag and a woman standing out here. And then over here, you have the slow children um, sign. So, you know, there's something, there's more, the more you look, the more you see, okay? So that's those pictures. Um, I, I'll continue with the other body of work, which is uh, entitled Sex, Death, and the History of Photography. And um, that, these pictures were done in 1989 and 1990. Now, I have to say, um, you know, I've been a photographer for a long time. Uh, I think I started in 1972. And ever since the beginning, uh, I've been a sucker for the history of photography. I love it. I've read a lot about it. I think that I have a, um, a pretty good visual memory for f photographs and who's done them. And uh, I often also think in terms of puns, visual puns, that sort of thing. You can, I think you can see that in some of the, um, the cliché vera pictures. Uh, so Sex, Death, and the History of Photography actually was one of those rare occasions where instead of just working through um, uh, a technique, uh, in other words, instead of just having no clue of what I'm going to do and just starting to work and establishing kind of a dialogue with the work, as Jasper Johns would say, you know, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it. It's kind of like you're having a conversation with the work, and then finally, you know, you see what you're doing, whereas when you started, you didn't really know. You were just going in blind. This group of pictures, at least the, um, the impetus from it, it sprang full-blown from my head one night when I couldn't sleep, and many things were running through my head and I had this picture in my mind of that Eddie Adams photograph um, that I showed you here of the execution of the Viet Cong terrorist and which is a very iconic and very disturbing photograph and I had a picture of that image of, of the um, of the Viet Cong terrorist alongside a photograph by Doc Edgerton, Dr. Harold Edgerton, who was an engineering professor at MIT, but he invented the strobe, okay? He invented the flash. And the, um, the iconic milk drop photograph, okay, or the bullet splitting the playing card in half at a millionth of a second, you know, those are, those are images that anybody who studies the history of photography knows right away. And I combined in my mind the Eddie Adams picture and the Edgerton picture of splitting the playing cards, the Jack of Hearts or Jack of Diamonds, I can't remember. And so I saw this picture in my mind. So I actually set it up. Um, I, I took a piece of uh, black velour and set a 4x5 camera on a copy stand looking down. And then I made a print of a blow up of this part of the picture. I, uh, I happened to live in Porter Square in Cambridge at the time, and right around the corner was Cambridge's only gun store, Roach Brothers, which is not around anymore. And um, so I went in there and I bought a 30 caliber bullet, and um, just the bullet, not the shell. And so I placed the bullet there, and I placed some sawdust here to, um, to mimic the card shredding, and I just took a picture. 
okay? And so, you know, it, the illusion is convincing, but that's how I did it. And then, so that started the series where I would go through history of photography books, and I'd take iconic pictures, uh, you know, pictures that were well-known, and I would re-photograph them. Uh, don't forget, this is 1989, uh, 1988, and really, for the past decade, people had been appropriating images. And actually, in 1981, I published um, an artist's book called Some Significant Self-Portraits, where I would collage pictures of myself into famous photographs. And I, I actually, in the back, uh, in the interview, there are some uh, uh, thumbnails of some of the early work that I'm talking about. And um, that one is, you know, this is a, you, you can't see it, but <laughs> This is a small version of a, a Belloc photograph from that book. So it was something that I was used to doing. So I would take one photograph and think, what other photograph can that fit into? So in this case, it's a Lartigue, uh, Jacques-Henri Lartigue photograph of one of his relatives diving into a pond, and then Harold Edgerton's milk drop photograph. Um, when I... I had the idea right off the bat in terms of what I was going to do, but what I was doing conceptually, okay, I knew technically what I was going to do, but what I was doing conceptually didn't come along until later. And I realized that many images, many of the images that I was pulling from the history books um, came from war photography, or nude photography, and so I thought about photography and I thought, you know, you can photograph anything, but in the history of photography, um, there have been a lot of photographs documenting conflict, which is one of photography's roles, even now with cell phones. Um, and also, there have been a lot of photographs of the nude, uh, you know, possibly for, uh, you know, prurient reasons, but also because it's a, it's a great history, in, it's a great part of the history of art. And it's also voyeuristic in a way that painting and sculpture perhaps is not because you're making, a, a, you know, a, a photographic image. And so I thought, okay, so photography is used for voyeuristic purposes in everything, you know, whether it's photographing um, a nude person or photographing a conflict, it's, it's this idea of being a voyeur. It's, it's being, you may be shocked, okay? Um, you may be motivated to do something, uh, you know, to, to help save the world, but you have this thing where you can't look away. So what I did was I started finding pictures that dealt with that and also dealt with other aspects of the history of photography. So that's where the title Sex, Death, and the History of Photography comes in, okay? So if we take this image, just as an example, the main image is by a photographer named E.J. Belloc, who was, um, he photographed around the turn of the century, um, and he was, I think that he was a dwarf or a midget or somebody who um, was kind of ignored or looked up upon, um, you know, not seriously by the general population at that time, you know, the, the, mostly the early 20th century. Um, he happened to be a brilliant photographer, and because he looked the way he did, he was not threatening to people. And he befriended um, the prostitutes in Storyville, which was the red light district in New Orleans. And he became kind of their mascot. And he had total access to all the brothels. And he had a big camera. And he'd walk around and he'd make these pictures. And he was actually um, discovered after his death by Lee Friedlander. His work was discovered. They were old glass plates. And Friedlander printed them up. And um, you know now anybody who knows about the history of photography knows about him. Um, you know, as I speak in 2015, um, maybe if you're interested in photography, you know about Vivian Meyer. 
okay, who was an unknown, who was discovered after his de her death. Um, Belloc was somebody like that, okay? And so this picture was taken at the turn of the century, and it's somebody who is, I'm assuming, um, a prostitute, uh, and she is posing for him, you know, completely uh, unabashed, you know, there's, there, there's no threat involved, she's posing for him as if she is a friend, you know, showing everything, okay? In the background is a photograph from right around the same time. It's by um, a woman named Gertrude Casebeer, who was a member of Stieglitz's, Alfred Stieglitz's circle, his photo secession. Now, during this time, and really in various permutations ever since, I still realize I'm on the first question, by the way, <laughs> In, in various permutations ever since, there has been this battle in photography amongst the photographers who want to show the world as it is, unmanipulated, and the photographers who want to manipulate the photograph in some way to show a more subjective uh, interior version of the world. Now, at this, at this time, the struggle was between um, the documentarians and the pictorialists, okay? The pictorialists were people like Gertrude Casebeer or Clarence White, um, people who, who wanted to imitate painting. So they photographed um, with lenses that were not very sharp, so the images were more ethereal, and also the subjects were more ethereal. So it's hard, I know that it's impossible to see here, but this is a very famous photograph. It's a woman in kind of a, a, a robe with presumably her daughter, uh, who is, I guess, preteen, and she's got her arm around her and she's leaning towards her in sort of a motherly, protective, but loving way. And they're in a doorway, so that's symbolic, so they're on a threshold. And, and the name of the photograph is Blessed Art Thou Among Women. And so I have the pictorialist's sort of view of women um, conflated with the documentarian view of women, which is not saying that every documentarian was like Belloc or every pictorialist was like Casebeer, but it was the kind of irony of those stru the struggle of those two schools of photography. Okay, which really went on in its first iteration until uh, Edward Weston and Ansel Adams and the F-64 group. Edward Weston actually started out as a pictorialist in the 1920s. And, you know, what he is remembered for is that he, he basically uh, solidified modernism. I mean, you look at his pictures or Adams' pictures or Stieglitz's later pictures, and, you know, they're all completely sharp. They were all very detailed. They were all, you know, enormous depth of field. That's why the group was called F64, because it was like the smallest aperture on the camera, and it gave the greatest depth of field. In other words, the most information possible. And that was high modernism in photography, because it was using the photograph and the, um, the camera in a way that only those materials could be used, just as high modernism in painting was re reduced to color, line, shape, that kind of thing, abstraction, okay? So um, anyway, so this is sort of representative of this. This is actually uh, probably completely unreadable by this camera, but it's two photographs by a Mexican photographer named Manuel Alvarez Bravo, who is probably the, the most important photographer at this time, up to this time, to come out of Mexico. And he, he lived a very long life. He died at age 100, I think, in um, maybe the, the late 90s, 1990s. Um, and these are two photographs. One is a very beautiful kind of uh, contrapposto, you know, light and shadow um, photograph of a woman combing her hair in a mirror, but it's just a sliver of light. The other one is an executed strike worker in Mexico with blood pouring out of his face. Um, so those are the two kind of 
uh, extremes of practice that that Bravo was involved with. I mean, he he was um, absolutely a surrealist and influenced by the surrealist movement, but he was also a documentarian, and he photographed things that happened in Mexico and things that were innate to Mexican culture. Okay, so um, uh, that's basically you know what this stuff is about, and. You know, I, I think I say this in, in the back of this um, book, there's an interview with um, a photo historian. And, you, you know, she, she says, okay, well, you know, you've been photographing for a long time, and people, uh, one of the things that you're known for is your sense of humor. And, um, you know, I, I have to smile at that, you know, no pun intended. And, and what I say is that, um, you, you know, I don't, I don't intentionally try to be funny. Um, I, I, I don't wake up in the morning and, um, and say, oh, I'm going to make some funny pictures today. Uh, I'm not a stand-up comedian. Uh, and I think that um, humor uh, comes from it's opposite, psychologically speaking. Um, and espe especially being a Jew. I mean, you know, people talk about, oh yeah, Jews are funny, that sort of thing. Well, they've been persecuted for thousands of years, you know. They have to come up with a way of dealing with the angst, of dealing with the horror. And uh, I have not been pers personally persecuted, um, you know, fortunately, but I think it's sort of become genetic at this point, or at least, it's um, it's handed down through through nurture, if not nature, and uh, pe people say, you know, oh, this this stuff is so funny. You must have had a great time making it. You know, you must have really had a good time. And and I say, no, I didn't have a good time making this. This was difficult. You know, this involved a lot of uh, you know effort and uncertainty and anxiety and all the stuff that goes with making artwork, you know, whatever it is. But I think that the impetus of humor is really its opposite. It's a way of dealing with um, existential crisis or existential dread. Um, so that's, that's my comment about people who think that, you know, um, I get up in the morning and, um, you know, have a, have a glass of V8 and, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really great and I want to make some jokes today, okay? So those are the two bodies that um, are in the book. This, this by the way, uh, was done earlier. This was done in 1985, I think, and it, it just shows that I'm always thinking about this. This is uh, Paul Strand's... Uh, uh, the, the title is Blind Woman, and the sign says blind, and she's not wearing the wig. And um, so I was, I was making kind of a visual pun. Okay, so um, that's on the back cover. The spotted dog is on the front cover. There's um, what I think is um, a pretty good in, uh, interview in the back, and uh, I think everybody would benefit from I think I think the world would be a better place. Um, if everyone had a copy of this book, I'm, I'm actually sending copies to um, to John Kerry. So in in the Iranian negotiations, um, I think I think it'll help solve that problem.